This is a topic this week uh, called Renewed Reading, I, is the title today. And it's the topic of not just reading the Bible, but listening and hearing God's Word. Kind of laying this out flat for us is reading the Bible may or may, it's not even a spiritual discipline, reading the Bible. Uh, we, have a, we have a son who's sight impaired, he's, he can't read, at least physically read a book. So it's obviously not reading. It's, there's more than that. And how many of us have read a Bible passage in the morning, and it's five minutes later, we have not even a clue what we just read. Am I right or wrong? So it's not the act of reading, but there's a, there's a word you can add to it that makes it much more specific, and it's a word that's a phrase, two words have been around, it's in Latin, it's been around for centuries and centuries and centuries, and it's called Lexio Divina. It's called divine reading. That's different. Divine reading. We read everything different. We'll read a, I'm, I'm reading all about on this weekend the news, reading about catching up on the Steelers and what's going on and their struggles. And I'm reading, you'll read a sports article different than you read, for instance, a textbook in college. It's a different kind of reading, different type of comprehension. And there's Bible reading. It's a league all of its own. It's called divine reading. Divine reading is bringing us into knowing God, not just knowing about God. I'll tell you a trap that we're in, there's no doubt, and when I say we, I mean evangelicalism today, we are all about reading the Bible as a textbook. We're learning huge amounts about God, but we're not growing hardly to the degree in knowing God. Two totally different fields. We're, in fact, we even elevate people in a church. We elevate those men and women who are able to so geniusly tell us about God. Oh, they know the Bible so well. They can explain, and we elevate that type of person And they may very well have the spirituality of a rock. It doesn't take spirituality to do that. It takes intellect. Dissecting. There's an author, Thomas Keating, said this, modern exegetes, that means like modern, uh, those that dissect the Bible, it, which, which is a good thing. Modern exegetes focus primarily on literal sense of Scripture, seeking out original meaning of words, cultural background. This research is valuable, but not the purpose of Lexio Divina. Divine reading is not done for the sake of information, it's done for the sake of insight. It's not to learn something but rather to encounter Jesus. Different kind of reading. We typically read to read. We read to learn. We're not reading for the sake of intimacy. Here's some words. So we could say things like, um, I want to grow into a deep, loving relationship with Jesus Christ. I want to grow in a passionate relationship with Jesus Christ. These are phrases in the spirit and tone of Lexio where you and I read the scriptures to encounter and to experience him, not merely for the sake of learning facts about him. It's very different. Knowing God and knowing about God are not the same. Knowing about God is really important. I have a PhD in theology. It's not a person who's going to criticize 
education or learning the languages and the culture and the background were for all of that, but it's never to the end in itself. It's a means to an end because the better that I can know about the book and understand it is the more solid I can stand upon it and experience God. Now, you may already be checked out. Okay, so let me bring you back real quick and show you how practical this is. There's always a debate in the world of churches about music. And one criticism of modern music is, uh, I'll give you some of the phrases, you may have used them. Uh, There's 7-Eleven songs, right? You've heard that phrase? It's seven words and you sing them 11 times, okay? Then the, the criticism grows to, yes, but if we sang, got to have the voice, if we sing the old hymns, I could teach theology to the young people because these old hymns have theology. You see what the debate is, actually? The debate is we're arguing from the side of elevating, I need to learn about God. Where much of modern music is the spirituality side, which is experiencing him and having a love relationship with Jesus Christ. Here's another criticism. Very often, it's, um, it's I, I got to do the voice. Um, these, these new worship songs, I don't know if you're singing to Jesus or if you're singing to your girlfriend. That criticism, I go... Thank you. That's exactly right. Because there is an intimacy with our relationship with Jesus, my intimacy with Jesus is very different than your intimacy with Jesus because we're totally different people. Jesus Christ died as a sacrifice that all who believe in him have eternal life, have relationship with God. So the belief in Jesus Christ, the beautiful story of the gospel, belief in Jesus opens up, which is otherwise impossible, relationship with God. And now I am in an intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. And so, yes, I'm going to sing, I love you, I love you, I love you, and I'm going to sing it ten times. And we have those that roll their eyes, oh, there's no content. Yeah, say that to a marriage relationship when they're just just in love with each other. Yes, it's I love you, I love you, I love you. It's just staring. Because it's different. It's passionate relationship with Jesus Christ. So that great old song, um, let's see, it was... Um, Oh, what's the old song? I, sent, I kept sending that video around. Uh, Phil Driscoll would travel with, and it was an old love song. Lori, I sent it to you to watch and mark. This is, this is to find out if you've really read emails that I have sent you. And they're like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I deleted that. Yeah. It literally is a love song that, that we all know. Who sings with that raspy voice? that old rocker. Yes, Joe Cocker singing. What's the famous Joe Cocker song? You Are So Beautiful. John Schnatterly, he walks in the room and he does a mic drop. He's like, that's all I needed. You Are So Beautiful by Joe Cocker. Y'all know the song, right? Don't make me sing it. written by a believer about his relationship with Jesus Christ. Did you know that? So YouTube, Phil Driscoll, he's a great trumpet player. Did you listen to Phil Driscoll at all back in the... Great trumpet player, also raspy voice, traveled Joe Cocker, sat with the writer of the song and listened to it and heard this guy explain about his love relationship with Jesus. That's spirituality. How do you get there? How do you do that? We're going to see it in the text in, John, or in Luke chapter 10, and I want to pray, and then we're going, to, we're going to go through this, I think, 
and uh, possibly have some help for us in renewed reading. Heavenly Father, we are asking that your Holy Spirit would warm our hearts today to this text. Help us to increase our loving relationship with our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. One of my favorite books ever is A Quest for Godliness by J.I. Packer. He said this, and it's a history of the old writers, Puritans of the past, and he said this, when comparing American Christianity with early American and British Puritanism, we recognize that American Christians are 2,000 miles wide and an inch deep. Wait a minute. But we have more Bible resources available to us today than anyone in the history of the church. Like, hands down. You have on your bookshelf more access to the Bible than the history of the church has ever had. And all you have is a concordance in a Bible or your Bible with a concordance in the back of it that is more than most have had in the history of the church. How is it that then we are 2,000 miles wide and an inch deep? How does that make sense? So we respond by doing more of the same. Well, let me study more. Let me go to another Bible study. That'll help. Definition of insanity, right? Let's do the same thing over and over, but I'm going to expect a different result. Or are we, or maybe, or maybe do we do something different? Some of you have read Dallas Willard. He passed away in 2013. He was chair of University of Southern California Philosophy Department for over 40 years. Conservative Christian over philosophy at USC if you can imagine. Listen to what he said. Depending on your religious background, you may think of regular church attendance, faithfulness to commonly recognized religious duties, as a means for radical transformation of our lives. And yet their track record of a means of actual transformation is not impressive. So just make the list. We can all do it. What is it that the Christian church today tells us that we should do in order to better interact with God and to have transformational growth? We'll say, and it's it's all the same, we will say, well, definitely go to church, go to some Bible studies, and read your Bible every day, and pray. That's it. Those are them. And we keep encouraging those things, and as Willard would say, none of those are to be despised. Those are very good. But why are they not producing the depth and spirituality that we're promoting that they would actually be creating? Transformation through Jesus Christ happens positionally when we receive Christ as our Savior, And then progressively, as we then are able to read God's Word as it is a letter to you personally, to read it, to listen to it, to hear it, to sit and rest. The same Christianity that teaches Bible reading, church attendance, as primary for spiritual growth has produced today a church with a divorce rate equal to that of the world. Is it fair to at least accept the possibility that we're heading down and actually promoting things that are good, but not promoting the things that actually will transform people's lives? Bible studies, Bible education, seminary classes will not in themselves ever produce deep spiritual people. How's that for a sentence? Bible studies, Bible education, seminary, Bible degrees do not in themselves produce spiritually deep people, although they're important. What are the enemy of the best is the good. 
We have more self-help resources than at any time in the history of the church, more theological knowledge than ever before, and yet an American Christianity that is 2,000 miles wide and an inch deep. So take a look at Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10, 38. Now, as they were on their way, Jesus entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. That is the million-dollar phrase right there. That is, I want to understand that phrase. Mary sat at the Lord's feet, listened to his teaching, but strong contrast, Martha was distracted with much serving, and she went up to him and actually said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. That's a bold statement, one of many things. This is a good thing. No, one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. This is so practical for us today. You literally are able to serve Jesus. He is in the house. He walks in, and we have two personality types that are very different And we have Martha, who we today can easily get caught up in, is Jesus is in the house, but I'm too busy serving. I have lots to do, and I'm literally serving Jesus, even with a good heart. So she's got the bagels and the cream cheese going in the other room. And she is upset, which is in itself its own study when those that are serving the most end up criticizing those who don't do enough. She's in the other room, and she doesn't even keep quiet about it. I love it. Goes to Jesus and says, isn't that fair? I can't believe her. She's done this my whole life. I've never even liked Mary. I mean, that that is a strong statement. Lord... Look at the criticism on Jesus. Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her to help me. This is is a lot of contrast happening. And then Jesus, I'm not sure of this, but by the first couple words, I think he probably grabbed her around the head and gave her one of these. I'm not positive. So, you know, that's not maybe so accurate, but grabs her and says, Martha, Martha. You little stinker, you. Martha, Martha. And is it not us? You are anxious and troubled about many things. But one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion. It will not be taken away from her. To you and your family, to me, you are worried and upset about many things. So you can drag other people in on it if you want. Jesus isn't going to help. He's not going to help you drag anyone into it. You are worried and upset. America, you are so worried and you are so upset about many things. What do we do? What do we do when the politics is this crazy? What do we do with the conflict of relationships and families that just not going away? What do we do with conflict in church? And there's also, what, what do I, I'm so worried and upset about many things. Ah, but Mary, she has chosen what is better. She has chosen the good portion. It will not be taken away. This is, this is one of those life-changing concepts that's worth you and I pausing to grasp. You are living in chaos. The anxiety, the bottles of meds in our cabinet prove it, that we're just popping them because we cannot control all the anxiety. Are meds good? Absolutely. Take the meds. The doctor says, and so take it. It's a good help, but it's not the answer. The counseling is a great idea. Go to your sessions. Don't miss them. The therapy is very good for you, and it's really good for people that are around you. 
but you're worried and upset about many things. Do not grab Jesus and God's word and bring it into the chaos of your life, demanding that God straightens out the chaos. Because that is exactly what I do. You wake up in the morning and say, well, okay, I just need to read this. I just, oh, this is, because I'm reading. I'm supposed to read. This is supposed to change my life, bring transformational growth. So I'm reading, like, okay, I'm going to read it. I'm going to read it. I'm bringing the scriptures or a devotional book or whatever it is, and I'm bringing it into the chaos of my life and saying, you promised me peace. When it's been the other way around, you and I set down the chaos of this life and we go sit at his feet and we just listen. Your life chaotic? Yeah, some days more than others, right? Yeah, there's tension and there's anxiety. And we're memorizing Bible verses and God, you promised that you'll do. And we're bringing all of that into our life We're taking a lot of the academia, the theology of it, and said, you came to bring peace. Oh, yeah, because he forgot. He forgot that's what he came to bring you. So bring me peace and bring me some sanity in the middle of all of this. He goes, now how about, how about this? How about if you leave the chaos and come to me and sit quietly with me? How about that? Well, it was Martha. She is so worried and upset about so many things that she literally saw in her mind who was a good person. We'll get to heaven and she'll be like, I'm not that bad. I'm I'm not that bad. It was a bad day. And she did leave me to do all the work. But she literally was troubled and upset And instead of, you know what, I'm just going to let this rest and I'm going to go sit because Jesus has two feet. Mary can sit at the one and I'm going to sit at the other. But she didn't. She goes straight to Jesus with the conflict and says, solve it. Make somebody else chaotic like me. And he goes, no. No, it's a choice. You can do that. You can stay that way if you want, or you could sit at Jesus' feet and listen to what he says. And there's the phrase. The NIV says, sat at the Lord's feet and listened to what he said. The New King James, sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. Mary, who was seated at the Lord's feet, listening to his word. Listen real quick, some of the quick conclusions. Number one is sitting at the Lord's feet is better than service. Mark it down. We see it right here. It's better than service. Second, we have many concerns, but only one is needed. Only one is necessary. And the question is then how? How do we do it? One thing is needed. Where does service fit? It's a a fair question. If Martha should have abandoned service and joined with Mary, who's going to serve? It shows the origin of Christian service. We're chaotic, so we're changing and we're doing and we're running project after project and it's all for the good of the Lord and it's the good of church and we're running and we do so much. Well, but who's going to do that? No, we're not speaking against service. We're speaking against the one thing that's needed is the one thing that's needed and then serve out of it. So you abandon chaos and we open God's word and we read it and listen to it and we're like, oh, this is beautiful. And we calm ourselves before God's word. And as we do, he directs and empowers service. 
but he's directing it and he's empowering it. We're not just doing it out of the chaotic of what I think needs to happen. We'll listen. Oh, we read it. We're like, yeah, 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 I got it. I'm reading it. And we eat the Fruit Loops really quick while we're doing it. We're just eating and we read. And we're, there's this chaos level of technically reading, but not listening, not hearing. Sarah and I have two favorite movies. And if you know the movies, you'll hear phrases all the time. One is The Ghost and Mr. Chicken by Don Knotts. Greatest movie ever. Our kids are always quoting it. The second would be, this is a little less known, without a clue. Am I right? Uh, Michael Caine. Uh, it's uh, Sherlock Holmes uh, and Watson, except Sherlock's an idiot and Watson's the genius. So there they are standing out in front. Another case is closed and they're all gathered at 221B Baker Street, thank you, and they're all standing there, and they're like, how did you do it? And Watson's off to the side, has scripted everything from, for Sherlock, and they said, how did you do it? And he grabs a guy, he says, he goes, he goes, how many windows are in the front of this building? And the guy goes, oh, I don't know. And he goes, aha, you see, but you do not observe. I see and observe. The place cheers, they go inside. Watson says, Sherlock, just for the record, how many windows are there on the front of this building? And he's taken off his garb and throws his, he goes, oh, I have no idea. That's our Bible reading. Read, but do not observe. Read, but do not listen. So there is a reading for the sake of knowledge. That's Bible study. If you're into the spiritual disciplines, that's Bible study. There is a time for a Bible study. Critically important to have good Bible study. But when we sit devotionally, we're not doing Bible study. We're reading for the sake of insight and experience. It's two totally different things. So if I'm reading devotionally, and I'm just taking a short passage, and I'm reading it and rereading it and just thinking it through and calm, like Mary sitting at the feet of Jesus, I'm just listening to it, inevitably my mind says, huh, that's an interesting word. I wonder what the origin of that word is. You are slipping from silence and solitude to Bible study. So you make a note off to the side. Look at that word. I'll study that later. That's not what I'm doing right now. Where is that village? So it came across a village where Mary and Martha, I wonder where that is later. That's not what we're doing right now. Right now, we're doing divine reading. We're soaking in and listening, listening, not just reading, to God's Word for the sake of it transforming us. We'll see it everywhere in the Scriptures. It's, it is everywhere. Proverbs 22, all through the Proverbs, is pay attention and listen. Pay attention and listen. Ecclesiastes 5, go near to the house of God and listen. Don't offer the sacrifice of fools. Just go and listen. Isaiah 30, in quiet and rest is your salvation. To American Christianity that's worried and upset about many things, Mary chose what's best. I'm going to give you three ways to say this. I want this to be so practical for us. How do you do it? That's the million-dollar question. How do you sit at the Lord's feet and listen to what he says? There's an old great writer, uh, 1600s, I think, Jean Guyon. She beautifully stated, God is not asking of you activity. He's asking for passivity. We're all active. Let me read this Bible. For, okay, that's good. Let me dissect it. And I came up with three points on how to, you know, quiet. Just read it. Sit quietly and soak it in. That's what's needed. Worried and upset about many things. Mary's chosen what's better. Sit at the Lord's feet and listen to what he said. Has chosen what is better and it will not be taken away. Here's a couple ways to say it. This is probably the most 
this is the most common way. It's the, uh, the read, reflect. Do you have that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those are actually, this isn't gimmick. This isn't something new. This isn't mine. This has been around probably 1,300 years. Said in different ways. There are actually Latin words for all of those. They might be in your bulletin. I might have put them in parenthesis after it. I thought I'd alliterate. It's good enough for Warren Wearsby, good enough for me. So we're going to just alliterate it, and this is what you do. How do you sit at the Lord's feet to see what he has to say? How do we do this? It's not Bible study, although that's good. It's read. You literally take the passage, three, four verses, whatever, and read it. But then reflect. Reflect. That would be like the cow that chews, regurgitates, swallows, digests, chews. It's ruminating. It's over and over. It's reflect. It's read, reflect. Read, reflect. Um, Ephesians 5, be imitators of God as dearly loved children and live a life of love. Hmm. Hmm. Be imitators of God as dearly loved children and live a life of love. Imitate God. Imitate him as a child and live love. Read, reflect, read, reflect, read, reflect. On a side note, by the way, Bible doesn't really ever speak of me, uh, memorization. Did you know that? The goal is not memorization. Like, I want to memorize a verse. No, it's read and reflect. And you do it so much that you happen to have it memorized. It's so funny because we get frustrated. We'll try to memorize a verse. Uh, Barney Fife reciting the preamble. Am I right? Where... You read it. You read this one verse over and over and over and over, and you're like, I got it, I got it, I got it. And you say, here, and you hand it to somebody, and you say, okay, give me the first word. B. 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 Second word. Imitators. Be imitators. And we're like, you're so frustrated with it. Well, the goal is not memorization. The goal is read, reflect, read, reflect, and what it's doing, uh, St. Francis used to say, read the Bible in such a way, it's like the, a bird is making a nest in your heart, slowly making a nest. Read, reflect. Just read it. Think about it. Reread it. Think about it. Reread it. Think about it. Read, reflect. How long do you go? Actually, go until you respond. This is getting very intimate and personal now because if I took Ephesians 5, be imitators of God, and I read it and reflected 10 minutes, I'm doing it until it produces in me a response. It's read, reflect, and then it has to produce a response. This is where it gets really personal. Some of you will read it 10 minutes and go, oh, here's your response. Lord, thank you so much. I love you. That's your response. Others in here will get to the point, they're like, I am so sorry. I don't do this at all. That's beautiful. He convicts some. He encouraged somebody else. Same text. How is that possible? Because God's word through faith in Jesus Christ, we have now a clean, clear access that God's Holy Spirit illumines our hearts through inspired word of God, and of course that's going to produce a response. But it's unique to you. Say the same thing to one of your kids. Are your kids not all different? You have a couple kids, they're very different. How you speak to them is very different. One of your kids, all you have to do is look at, kind of mean, they break down and they will never do whatever it is they did wrong ever again, right? Another kid, you look at them mean, and they look right back at you mean. And you're like, they're six. How did they do that? 
That's where all of a sudden we realize we go from the objectivity of God's Word, and it's always been objective truth, but as God interacts with us, it's tailored to you. It's read, we reflect, we respond, and there are volumes written on the last one, which is rest. This is that level of contemplation where we are actually in a union with God and his word. And I'm going to tell you, if you're chaotic, you're not getting there. You can't get there where you're like, ah, oh, I responded to him. He speak. It's communion. Uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who said prayer is not monologue, prayer is dialogue. Have you heard that phrase? Prayer is not monologue. Prayer is not you just speaking. Prayer is you speaking and him speaking. So when you have God's word and you're reading it and reflecting, he's speaking to you, which produces a response back, and you're in a dialogue. That's the true, beautiful essence of prayer. And it leads to a point of rest or contemplation. Look at the second example. These get easier. This is an easy head, heart, feet. Head, heart, feet. So head is Bible study. I want to understand the text. Be imitators of God as dearly loved children. Live a life of love. I want to understand the words, and I want to get it. But what we've done in the church so often, and many of you have been raised this way, I absolutely have been raised this way, where it's head, feet, head, feet. The Bible says this, go do it. Head to feet to go live it. The Bible says stop doing that. And you're like, okay, I'm going to try to stop. Head, feet, head, feet. That's legalism. There's no power in it. There's no grace in it. It's simply you do this and go do it. What's missing is the heart. You can't go from the academic of it to go and doing it. Well, you can for a while. We've seen the kids that try it, and they, they're kept under that thumb. And then finally, when they're out from it, they just live like the devil because they have the freedom to live like the devil because nothing changed on the inside. We only changed the outside so long as you could see it. What's real transformation? It's head and allow it from the head to sink into the heart, the bloodstream. And as it goes from head, be an imitator of God and live a life of love. Yeah, I'm not very loving. I'm selectively loving. And God goes, yeah, it's true. I need to be more loving. And he goes, yes, but you're my dearly loved child. Oh, thank you. Head, reflect, heart. Once God's word is in the heart, it goes to the feet. So that's what we want to do for new believers. A young person, we don't want to bring a young person to Christ and say, okay, welcome to the freedom of grace in Jesus. Here's the top 100 things that you better start doing right away. And they're like, okay, this is overwhelming. And so they try it for a while, and they're like, I can't keep up with this. Then they follow the rules so long as you're looking, and they're not following it when you're not looking. Am I right? Is this a, That's head feet, head feet. So all of a sudden, with a new believer in Christ, we only want them to do one thing. You've been saved through faith in Jesus Christ. Go spend time with him. Sit at his feet, and we can back away, because as long as they're sitting at the feet of Jesus, he'll tell them everything they need to know. There's the focus. It's head, heart, feet. So then what do we do as a church? Well, as a church then, what should we be asking each other and keeping people accountable with? Of course, keep accountable in areas of sin that we're struggling. We're not saying that's a bad thing. That's a good thing, but it's not the one thing that's necessary. Why wouldn't it be normal conversation to say, hey, how you doing? Butch, good to see you. Man, I haven't seen you in a week. Hey, how's your time in the Word going? What's the Lord been teaching you lately? I'm asking about his head heart, keeping him accountable in head heart. 
The feet, he may have dirty feet. He's doing things and going places that he shouldn't be going. This is a warning. And so he may be doing all of that, but I'm not asking about that. I'm just, because I want to see change in Butch's life. Butch wants to see change in my life. And the change happens not by pointing everything that's wrong with me. You don't have time for that anyway. It's to point the one thing that's most needed. Make sure I'm staying in the word. Make sure I'm going head heart, head heart. And then the feet just happens. Here's the last one, last example of what it means. This is from Basil Pennington. These are church, uh, these are Catholic church leaders. I've quoted a couple, uh, Thomas Keaton, um, Basil Pennington. This is a, a field of spirituality, Richard Foster. Basil Pennington refers to this. How many of you guys, like in the summer, you, what's the lake? Is there a lake that everyone goes to? Isn't there a deep creek lake or something? Um, I think you told me about that one. So imagine a lake, and imagine all the fun that's going on on it, and there's uh, paddle boards and um, maybe even a boat and a skier, frisbees coming out of nowhere, uh, there's birds. Just imagine the chaos. That's where we live every day. We live in the chaos. I mean, it's a, a, a commercial, and it's a newspaper, and it's people talking, and they say crazy things, and we join with crazy. We live in the chaos of this. That's where we live. And because we live there, we bring our Bible into it. And we go, okay, this is a crazy day. Okay, hey, don't remember, you've got to read your Bible this morning. Okay, and we read it, and we're like, and we're reading the Bible at the surface of the lake with the chaos of everything else. That is reading, it's not divine reading. That's reading, it's not listening. So Basil Pennington refers to sinking below the surface, below the chaos, into the stillness of the water below. That's where it is. That's where you go. And you can do it in the middle of chaos. Depends how good you are. For some, you need, and some of you do this, of course you do, where you're sitting in this quiet morning and the, it's uh, at the kitchen table and there's no TV on and you found that stillness below the surface. You've created it. I think I might have mentioned, we had a friend, he's a big guy, arena football player. He uh, worked as an accountant. He went under his desk for an hour every day. And I'm like, you fit under your desk? That was my biggest deal. And he goes, because if the phone rings, it's so far away. It's like it's a different world to me. I'm able to sit and listen to God's word under here. I see what he's trying to do. You can do it in chaos, but it takes discipline. How do you sink below? And you know it when it happens. I know when I open the God's Word and I read like a proverb and I'm reading through and I'm in a hurry. I'm at the surface. And I'm literally saying to God, come on, hurry, say something quick. And I think he gently says, no, why don't you just go live your day? Because that's where your mind is. Just go. It's okay. Go. You don't need me. And I go, okay, I get it but my car may not start. He goes, no, it may not. But what's more important? Okay, me sitting with you. And we sit there. We calm ourselves and we read the text. Quietness. And then we say, you know what? It's not my day anyway, is it? It's your day. And he goes, yes. It's probably not going to go the way I want it to go, is it? And he goes, no, you wait and see. Something bad going to happen today? He goes, I'm with you. I've never hurt you. I go, I know you haven't. He goes, just sit here and rest with me. Okay. I'll sit here. And we've made it from reading and reflecting and responding to actually the point where we're resting. The goal, is that the goal? Hmm. The goal is to take that rest, that stillness below the surface, 
The goal is to take that rest and maintain it throughout our day. If anybody with a phone call or a comment can change your mood, that means you're too connected to people. You're not connected enough with him. That's a gauge. Doesn't take me long. I'm like, oh, that's really great. Lord, and I feel the freshness of resting with him and listening to his word, and I stand up and the phone rings and I grab it and I'm instantly out of it. Or the car's honking and people are mad because my car doesn't go fast. And I'm like, oh, I'm so frustrated. I've lost it. The goal is to live in that state, which takes discipline and takes time. Let me end with this. I'm sorry I went over today. The, um, uh, Serena Williams is a great tennis player. And I will say she's not related. Just those of you that are wondering, we are not actually related. Um, <clears throat> she's an she's a incredible tennis player. I, I can string tennis rackets. If you have a racket that needs strung, I have a machine and the string, so I'll do that for you for free. If you want to imitate what Serena Williams does on Saturday, that's usually when a women's finals match is on Saturday. <clears throat> if you want to imitate her, don't imitate what she does on Saturday, because you're going to hurt yourself. You need to imitate what she does during the week. The eight hours of tennis every day. The weight room. Because that is what's producing what you see on Saturday. If you and I want to walk with God and be one of these greats that has a prayer life that is like nobody else's, and that's just they exude the Holy Spirit. Don't try to imitate that. You're going to hurt yourself. Imitate what got him there. What got him there, and read the greats, the most wonderful women in the history of the church. Read what they did. Read of the great men in the church. Look at their disciplines and discover they sat with God's Word, and they weren't, although they knew God's Word, they loved Bible study, that's not what transformed their heart and their mind. It was the devotional reading. It was the sitting and enjoying a passionate relationship with Jesus Christ. You sit and open it, it's just for you. And you grow. And that's what changes us and cleans us. That's what makes our foot traffic all of a sudden going to the right places and doing the right things. We need to imitate what happens the six days a week. I'll end with this. If you don't have a relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ, it's not going to happen. I can't do any of this. There is a barrier between me and God, and it was sin. It didn't take much. Sin separated me. But faith in Jesus Christ, his sacrifice paid for the sin, and faith in Jesus Christ allowed that relationship to happen. And that's where it may start for some of you. And then for others, are you neglecting the very thing in which we were saved for? We were not saved to do jobs for him. We weren't saved just so that we could go to heaven. We were saved for a relationship with God. There's an intimacy and a personal relationship with Jesus Christ that you and I can enjoy every single day as we open God's Word and read it as divine reading, as listening and allowing it to soak in from our head to our heart and then into our lives. Would you say amen to that? Amen? Why don't you stand with me right now? I'm well aware, <clears throat> maybe all of you do exactly what I've said. I made it more complicated. I put words to what you already do. I'd say I'm encouraging you to keep going. For others of you that it was new, kind of a new way of reading, call me. Talk to someone else in here that sits quietly like Mary at the Lord's feet, and they would love to show you all the more how to do that. 
We are reading through Oswald Chambers, My Utmost for His Highest, just for fun, starts tomorrow. If you don't have a copy, they're out in the lobby, just grab one on the way out. And that's just to give us something familiar to talk about throughout the year. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, I pray a blessing upon everyone who's listening online, everyone who's sitting here. We acknowledge we love Jesus Christ. We are grateful for him and for the access that we have every single day to sit and listen, just like Mary. Lead us to that end all the more, more than ever, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed.